let me start by briefly outlining the free speech principles, as Joanne rightly said. There are so many misunderstandings about this. Uh, too often we hear binary statements, each opposite from the other, but linked by being equally incorrect. So we often hear uh, even public officials and journalists, people and lawyers, people who should know better, saying hate speech is not free speech, right? Uh, that was said when Ann Coulter was denied a platform at Berkeley last spring, uh, Howard Dean, who had been chair of the Democratic National Party, governor of Vermont, presidential candidate, said, well, Berkeley didn't violate her First Amendment rights because hate speech is not free speech. And many others have made the similar uh, incorrect statement. Conversely, we often hear statements that hate speech is constitutionally protected. And that absolute statement is also not completely correct. As I appreciated more and more from doing the research for my book, American law really is nuanced and makes a great deal of common sense. So it is true that the Supreme Court never has labeled, defined a category of speech as hate speech. So uh, throughout the book, I put the term in quotation marks. I'm not going to keep giving you air quotes, but just imagine those from now on. It is not a constitutional law term of art precisely because the court never has defined and identified a category of speech based on its hateful, hated content message or ideas and said it's categorically excluded from the First Amendment. So it's different, for example, from obscenity, which is a category of sexual expression defined by content that the court has said, most of us think incorrectly, but that's the subject of another talk. Uh, obscenity is a term of art for categorically excluded expression. Hate speech is not. Uh, on the other hand, the Supreme Court has said when you get beyond the content or message of the speech and instead look at its overall context, speech with a hateful message along with speech with any other message may in certain contexts be punished, specifically if in context, under all the facts and circumstances, that speech directly causes certain specific, imminent, serious harm, which cannot be prevented short of punishing the speech. So law enforcement would not suffice, uh, education and debate would not suffice. That's a very strict exception, but it is satisfied by many important situations involving hateful speech. And the court has also created subcategories of speech that satisfies what I call this emergency standard. So for example, a true threat, which does instill a reasonable fear in a particular audience member. It's got to be specifically targeted, not the way we use the term threatening in a more loose sense. Uh, an intentional incitement of imminent violence. And let me give you one other example. Uh, we usually call it hate crime or bias crime, and that is a constitutional law term of art unlike hate speech. Uh, the court has said that if something which is already a crime, such as an assault or vandalism, uh, when the victim is singled out for a discriminatory reason, such as race, religion, sexual orientation, society can deem that to be a more serious crime on the theory that it causes more harm to the victim and to society as a whole, so it can be subject to an enhanced punishment. Um, let me give you one example of a recent case in which the United States Supreme Court unanimously refused to create the, and recognize a category of unprotected hate speech. It was less than a year ago, uh, one of the court's most recent free speech cases, and it was called Mittal versus Tam. Simon Tam, an Asian American rock musician, had created a band consisting of other Asian American rock musicians, and they gave their band a name which traditionally has been a, uh, an ethnic slur. So on some campuses, I would have to give you a trigger warning at this point. Uh, they called their band the Slants, 
Well, guess what? Simon and his fellow Asian American rock musicians were not choosing that name because they wanted to denigrate people of Asian origin. It was exactly the opposite. They were celebrating their ethnic heritage, asserting their pride, uh, seeking the empowering step of reclaiming and reappropriating that term. But the bureaucrats in the US Patent and Trade Office decided that it was disparaging on the basis of ethnicity, and they denied Simon the right to choose his name uh, to give his inter, and uh, by the way, it was a play on words. It was his slant on the term as well, and he chose it uh, for that reason as well. Fortunately, the United States Supreme Court, nine to zero, struck down that law. And I emphasize two points here. Number one, for all of the division that we see on the court, on so many civil liberties and constitutional law issues, this is a point where there is enormous consensus. And I think regardless of what point you are on the ideological spectrum, it behooves you to join with the Supreme Court in celebrating not only, and here's my second point about that case, in one fell swoop, what was being respected was not only his free speech rights, but also his equality rights. Mm -hmm.